Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Shiloh Community Church, 10.30 a.m. online service. You may hear throughout this service recording my handsome son making handsome noises in the background because he's such a happy boy. But apart from that, I think it will be a normal Sunday recording as per we are getting used to. Just a reminder that we have our WebEx meetings following service at 1 p.m. We also have them on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Don't forget to catch our devotional on the Psalms at 7 p.m. as well. That's it for me. And again, if you would like to show up on uh, Sunday at any time, just contact me so we can make sure we stay within the uh, capacity requirements that have been set for us. I will be seeing you at our time of scriptural reflection. Until then, take care, friends, and God bless. Our scriptural reflection this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Matthew in the third chapter and the second verse. The third chapter and the second verse of the book of Matthew I'll be reading in the New Revised Standard Version. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. The Bible doesn't do things all at once. And what I mean is, yes, we are continually exhorted to confess our sins. We are always reminded to live a righteous life. We are told to be aware that there is a God who sees and who judges all our actions and all our deeds. But God gives great allowance. He lets people run amok, so to speak. He lets us do as we will, good or evil, until the appointed time 
There comes a time when Jesus draws near and asks you to repent of what you've done and to be saved. There comes a time then to where we die, and there comes a time then too when we face the judgment throne of Almighty God. There is a timing to God's kingdom. Many people are allowed to do as they will for long periods of time because the time of judgment has not yet come. Many Christians languish in sin for a long period of time because the time of liberation has not yet come. But when those moments come, when those times draw near, it is on us to repent. It is on us to draw near to God, for God has come near to us. Emmanuel, God with us. Would you join your hearts with me in prayer? O Lord, our Governor, how excellent is thy name in all the world. Thou that has set thy glory above the heavens. We praise you, Almighty God, who sits enthroned above the flood, who sits enthroned above this world and all mortal cares. But we know that you are not unacquainted with our situation. We know that you know what it means to be man. For on Christmas Day, God became man. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done in redeeming us from sin and rescuing us from the power of Satan and all the darkness that has entrapped our human hearts. And surely we know that darkness. Lord Jesus, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to give us strength, anointing, and power to live in grace and soberness for your name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Him there, the risen Lamb, 
My perfect spotless righteousness The great unchangeable I am The King of glory and of grace One with himself I cannot die My soul is purchased by his blood on high with Christ my Savior and my God with Christ my Savior and my God one with himself I cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with Christ on high Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God I would just like to thank uh, my wife, Jessica, for her inspired singing and also her <laughs> wonderful piano playing. Herman, also your great singing, guitar playing, fantastic as always, and Ruth, amazing on the piano. And when you sing, it uplifts my soul. I will say it plainly. I will say it clearly. That is what I feel. Again, pardon if you, I don't know if you are hearing him, but I hear my son making uh, noises throughout this. But we will move on to the sermon portion of our divine service. We are in the Gospel according to St. Luke. We are in the 14th chapter, and we are in what I believe to be, oh, now I forgot, the 12th verse all the way down to verse 24. Luke chapter 14, verses 12 down to 24, the nervous forgetting moments. Now, this is going to be slightly different for us friends online because it is such a long portion I'm actually gonna break it up I'm gonna break it up in half we're gonna read the first few verses together and then we're gonna read the parable that Jesus tells on the great dinner because that's what this passage is alternatively called the great dinner parable our text begins with Jesus at a supper and he uses the supper as an occasion to tell two parables on suppers this makes perfect sense. He then enumerates a few principles through these parables. And these pick up towards the end of the chapter and he closes off with them. So how about we get our Bibles out. Luke chapter 14. I'll be in verse 12 to verse 14 to begin. Luke chapter 14 verse 12 to 14. We're going to talk about this and explain it briefly. Reading in the New Revised Standard Version. 
He said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, the New Revised Standard Version. My sermon title today is God's Justice. God's Justice. What is God's method of evening accounts? People experience a lot of suffering, tragedy, and sorrow in this world. People experience a lot of hardship through life in general from the many things, whether it's things that happen to us seeming by a freak accident, things that we do ourselves to others. Where is the just and good God that we are told about in the scripture? Well, Jesus, when he comes down to earth, he reveals to us God's method of operation. He reveals to us how God is going to balance the scales, so to speak, at the end of time. How the eye for an eye will be satisfied, how things will be evened out as justice would require them. And so he's invited to this dinner. He's at this dinner, and he uses this dinner as an occasion to tell a few uh, teachings. We're starting kind of towards the middle of this dinner he's been invited in. And at this point, Jesus observes the guests at the dinner. And he is here making a point. The point he is making is that if we want to do something virtuous, if we want to do something generous, if we want to show grace... To others, there is going to be a cost. And the cost is that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, will turn upside down the value system and practices of this life. The reason is, it's not arbitrary. It's not some literary device. It's not just something Jesus likes to say to shock us. He doesn't like to just confuse us by telling us to invite people we would normally not let set foot in our homes. That's not what he's doing. What he's telling us is that there are two lives. There are two lives that are really one, for you are the same person in both of them. And if you live only for this life, if you have your luncheons and your dinners, only for your friends, only for your own enjoyment, only for this, then you will get just that. You will get your reward in this life. But when you are generous, when you are virtuous, when you do what is not expected of you, when you do something kind, when you look to those who are unwanted, now, not everyone who is necessarily in a hard situation is poor, crippled, lame, and blind. Jesus is using these as a type to stand in for the unwanted of society. Those whom people do not want to associate with, whoever they be. And that changes. It's not necessarily society as a whole. There's lonely people who feel unwanted everywhere. These are the people God has in mind. These are the ones God wants you to invite. Those who can't really pay you back, those who cannot return to you anything good for the good you've done to them. Why? Not because God wants you to lose out. It's the opposite. Because whatever expense is incurred on your behalf for blessing these people, there is a debit made in heaven. The Father is keeping track of what you do. And when you meet him at the resurrection of the righteous, he then will give you your due reward. That is how God works. That's how this world works, and that is his justice. Now, there's something very significant about here that we don't emphasize a lot, which is that generosity, by definition then, has to have a price. In order for there to be a debit incurred on God's behalf, in order for us to do something such that God would have to recompense us at a later time, we must be doing something that is a real, genuine expenditure. A real, genuine expenditure. Generosity is not something that is owed. It is something that is given freely by grace. Jesus is teaching us a fundamental principle about grace, mercy, generosity, virtue as a whole. These are all things that cost us something. And that cost will be paid by the Father. That is what he is telling us. And he has given us an example in his son, Jesus Christ.
Jesus, friends, gave his life for the world. He gave all that he was, his existence, his eternity, he gave it for you and for me. We were sinners. All of us, like sheep, had gone astray. No one is perfect. We know we are not perfect, and we know we die, and we would like to be perfect, hopefully, and we would like to live forever, hopefully. And to those whom want it, Jesus has made a way. For God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus bears all our prices, all our burdens, all our sufferings, everything. And in that body with which he was crucified on the tree for our sin, he lives in that body forevermore. As he said to St. Thomas, put your hands in my hands and in my side. Feel the wounds that he will bear forever. Christ did that for you and for me. And for Jesus, there is a recompense. There is a reward. There is an evening of the accounts for his generosity. That's what it tells us in Psalm 2, that God the Father said, You are my son. This day have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Jesus' reward for the good he has done for the world is that he has purchased for himself a kingdom, the kingdom of God. He has bought for himself a people. He has owned for himself a heaven and an earth. And he will be made Lord of all, sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, where he now sits, waiting to come into his inheritance, which he has bought with his blood. Waiting for the appointed time. And that's where we kind of get into the next portion of what Jesus is teaching here. And I also want to just summarize what I've said into a few digestible points. The first point is that grace has a time. There is a time of grace. Notice, the things you do, generous, gracious in this life, there will then be a time when grace ends, when we don't need to be generous, we don't need to be gracious. The same is true of us as it is of God. There is given a time where God will be merciful, where he will let people sin, he will let them do whatever they want, but then, after the time of grace, there comes a time of recompense, a time of judgment, a time of evening the accounts, a time of justice. There are two times. So in this life, we are living in a life of grace. Things will be very unfair because that is the nature of grace. That is what mercy is. That is what generosity is. By definition, it is something unfair where you give something to someone who didn't work for it from what you yourself have worked and earned. That is generosity. It's unfairness. And we are in an age of the world where things will be unfair in every sense of the word. But there will come a time, the next life, the resurrection of the just is what Jesus calls it, the resurrection of the righteous. At this time, it will be a fair world. God will repay what was done. Now, at the end of the day, we all know you cannot truly repay God because everything is a gift from him. Even the rewards he gives us. I mean, the life that we have, we didn't make it ourselves. We did not make ourselves. God made us. That's what the Bible says in Psalm 100. We are not our own. And yet, though we have received this whole world, our lives, everything we are as a generous gift from God, he has given us another grace, an opportunity to store up treasure in heaven. Grace upon grace upon grace. Generosity upon generosity to an increasing degree. He gave us life and then we sinned. And he gave us abundant life. He gave us eternal life. We messed up in the garden and then he gave us the world. That's how God operates with people. Generosity and grace. Now we get into Jesus' teaching. His teaching on this subject. And what's underneath Jesus' teaching, and it's something we cannot forget, is that because generosity is something that is unfair by nature, there is a potential to sin against it. What do I mean? If someone is generous to you, if someone is kind to you, if God is merciful and generous and kind, and we sin against God, we incur a double guilt, a double penalty. Because it's one thing to harm a stranger, it's another thing to betray a friend. It's another thing to take from someone who has given you so much. And that is something we can never forget. Generosity, grace, and mercy have a price 
They have a value. They have underneath them a system. They are not truly free for everyone. That is what's underneath this parable. So we will then go to what Jesus wraps up about these three points we have mentioned. The time of grace, a time of judgment, of recompense, and also that generosity, grace, doesn't come without a cost. Let us read then the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter, the 15th to the 24th verse, the New Revised Standard Version. One of the dinner guests on hearing this, that there is a repaying at the resurrection of the righteous for inviting people who you wouldn't normally invite the disadvantaged, on hearing this said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I must go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have just been married, and therefore I cannot come, doesn't offer an apology. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. The word of the Lord. How about we pray and we will dive into this. Almighty Father God, we ask that you guide us as we discuss your most holy word. We ask that you lead us into all truth, Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we ask that by your blood we would have salve anointing our eyes, that we would be able to see clearly your truth, what you have prepared for those who love you and are called according to your purpose, whom you love. We thank you, Almighty Father, and we just ask that you bless this time in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this parable that Jesus tells is significant. It wraps up all those things we talked about, that there is a time for grace, that there is a time then for judgment, for recompense, for rewarding, for people to get their just desserts, so to speak. And then also that generosity has a price. The king is angry when they do not accept his invite because setting the table of the dinner wasn't free. It cost him something. And so when he invited those who were supposed to come, who in their hearts knew they were invited, they didn't care. And that is wrong. When someone has put great expense on us and we are invited and we are to be there and we are not there, that is wrong. (laughs) It's not a kind, it's not a nice thing to do. And in this context, even more so because Jesus isn't talking about hurt feelings or weddings or, or dinners or parties. He's talking about himself. You see, in this parable, Jesus says, someone gave a great dinner. Who is the someone? It is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What is the dinner? It is his body, it is his blood, it is salvation which he has given freely to the world. That's what it is. This is the dinner that Christ has invited everyone to, eat my flesh, drink my blood, believe in me, be one with me and be saved. That is Jesus' invitation. And so, when the dinner is ready, when all has been accomplished, when the cross is done and Christ is raised and in heaven, he sends out his slave to invite those who were supposed to come. The Bible says to invite many. Many were invited. It doesn't say all were invited. What is the significance of this? Well, Jesus is here speaking from the standpoint of what we observe in this world. What do I mean by that? It is true, the Bible says, that Jesus' cross covers the whole world. For the Bible says, when I am lifted up in the Gospel of John, I will draw all men, all humanity, 
all people to myself. For he is the propitiation of not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 1. Jesus' cross, his blood, is expansive. Is it, it's limitless because it is tied to his indestructible life. It is without end, without scope. It cannot be exhausted. His forgiveness has no barriers. There is nothing someone can do that Jesus will not forgive. And there is no person whom Christ has not died for. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever from that world that he gave his son to would believe in him and have everlasting life. Now, why then does it say many? It says many because when you look out into the world, we see that the church, those whom Jesus has invited, is not the whole world. It is those to whom the gospel has been given. The church is a real thing. You know, it's not just some idea out there in the ether. The gospel spreads from person to person to person. When Jesus came in Judea, when he came to Palestine in that time at 0 to 30 AD or 3 to 33 AD, however you want to count it, if he came at that time, well, then he wasn't in Russia. He wasn't in China. He wasn't in North America. He wasn't with the Aztecs. He was with the Jews. There is a time. There is an invitation that goes out. And the invitation is the preaching of the gospel. And not everywhere in the world has the gospel been preached. In other words, not everyone in the world has been invited. And truly, not everyone in the world will get an invite. Because the gospel doesn't go into all corners of the world unless it is brought by messengers, by slaves, angels and the Holy Spirit speaking to people's hearts, softening them, and ministers of the gospel like me, like you, whoever is a Christian, sharing the truth of God's love. Those are the invitations to salvation. Those are the invitations to the church. And only many will be invited because there are many also who will never receive an invite. Well, what does God do with them? We won't deal with it in this sermon. Jesus does talk about this in other places, but we're not going to deal with it now. He's dealing specifically with the invited. Who are the invited? If we want to put it very plainly, if you are listening to this sermon, if you are hearing my voice, if you are hearing this preaching of the gospel, you are one of those Christ has invited. You have been invited to be a Christian and to share with Jesus in that great dinner. Now then, the first group that the slave comes to says, no, I'm busy. I have my oxen, I have my land, I have my wife. I'm busy. I don't have time for this dinner. The second group that is invited is the lame, the blind, the poor, the crippled, which are not literal. They are representative as the first group is also representative. And the third group are those that are on the highways and the byways or the lanes and the hedges, the roadways, or however you want to say it, people who are wandering. We can put these three groups of people who are invited as representatives for these three different categories. As the someone is a representative of Jesus, as the dinner is a representation of those who will be with him when he comes again, his church, salvation. So then this first group is representative of those who have every advantage. Those to whom the gospel comes and they get the invite clearly and plainly. This is the first group. The second group are those who are disadvantaged. They have obstacles preventing them from answering the gospel call. They can't just walk to the wedding, they need help. They can't just go to the dinner, they need assistance. And then the third group are those who are distanced. They are far away, they're down the roads, they're in the highways, they're wandering away. Those are the three groups. Let's explain what they mean. They do not represent, you know, each time periods. I think one could argue that the first group represents the Jews who Jesus, when he came to his earth, when he came to the earth, the Bible says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But I don't think that's what is in mind because it says the dinner is ready. Everything is is ready come now come for everything is ready so what that tells me is this is referring to the period of time after christ's resurrection to his second coming which has not yet occurred yet we are essentially in this period of time and in this period of time there are three groups of people 
broadly speaking, who will encounter the gospel. The first are those who don't have an obstacle preventing them from obeying. They have decent lives, so to speak. They have every reason they've heard the gospel invite, but they are simply too busy with their lives to pay attention. They have too much going on. The things of God are not important to them. The gospel said, believe and be saved. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And these people said, well, I can't come to church on Sunday. I'm busy. I I can't read my Bible. I'm busy. I don't have time to follow the teachings of Jesus. I got other things to do. I don't need to do all this Christian stuff. Why? Because I'm busy. It's not that I don't believe in it. Yeah, sure. it's, It's great. I just don't have time. These people do not taste the dinner. These people don't get an opportunity to receive what Christ is offering. Because if you are too busy for God, you may find that he too will one day be busy, too busy for you. Because there is a time where grace comes to an end and where judgment comes. We're in that time of grace. Don't be too busy for God, friends. We don't know when our time comes. Don't put anything off for tomorrow. Don't think that tomorrow you can try and live for Christ. Live for Christ today. The second group then. The poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. These are those who have a disadvantage preventing them from coming to the banquet. People who by the real circumstances of life are unable to come to church, to come to God, to receive that invitation. There are people who are isolated, people who are hurt, who have been hurt by things that have happened to them in the church and things like that, who have a hard time coming to faith in Jesus Christ. There are people who have been through much in this life, who have suffered much in this life, who because of their lives have a bit of a hard time seeing God in control of everything. These are the people who have a struggle to overcome, an obstacle. And what this parable is telling you, that whatever obstacle you have standing between you and Jesus, you're invited all the same. There is no one who cannot come when they have been called. There is no person who, when they hear the gospel, does not have the ability to respond. You may look at your situation and think, well, I can't make it. I can't make it to the dinner, but God has sent his angels. He has sent me. He sent his Bible. He sent whoever into your life to invite you to God's house, to be part of God's family, to be saved. So don't put it off. Whatever situation is preventing you from coming to Christ, whether it's past sin, guilt, or anything like this, or injury, isolation, whatever it is, come. Come. Jesus loves you. And Jesus wants you. And we would love to have you. The third group of people are those who are distanced. Those who have wandered away, it would seem. They are on the roads. They are making their way. This to me are those who grew up in church. Who heard the gospel invite. But for whatever reason, throughout their lives, they wandered. It could be that they grew up in a church where the preaching was dead. The pulpit was powerless. They had questions and the pastor could not answer them. He could not satisfy their doubts. And so they wandered disillusioned from the faith. There are people who grew up in churches that are not good churches. There are people who know Christians that are not good Christians. And they have a hard time coming to faith. To these, the servants of the Lord, the slave has been sent to bring them in, to compel them, is the word, compel them to come. If there's room in your heart for Jesus, Jesus will find room in his house for you. Don't let anything, any past history, anything that has happened in any church, anything that any church person has done to you, anything a minister has failed to answer, stop you from hearing the gospel call. This is the gospel call. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus wants to spend forever with you. Would you believe in Jesus and be saved. Take this Bible, read it daily. Seek God every day and he will answer your doubts. He will send people to aid you. He will do all that is needed to get you there in time for the dinner, in time for salvation, in time for his return. 
Then we come to the end of this parable, where Jesus says, none of those who have been invited will taste of my dinner. In other words, there are those who heard the gospel call, who rejected it. They were the invited ones, the ones whom God sent the Bible to in this world. There are many people all across this world that don't have access to scripture, don't have access to church, don't have access to anything related to Christ. And there are those who do. And to those who do, who have ample opportunity, who have been brought in from the byways and the highways, who are not disadvantaged, God has helped you, he's lifted you up, who are given a fair and appropriate way to see the gospel, those who reject it, there is no place for you. Because God's house is full now. Because the time has come to an end. Because mercy is done. And it is now time for justice to settle the accounts. We need to see our lives, everything we do, in the perspective Christ does. When Christ looks at an individual, he doesn't see us in the moment. And I hope that's what this parable shows to us. It doesn't show you as you are one moment in your life. I mean, who throughout their life isn't busy sometimes for God? Who in their life sometimes isn't, you know, disadvantaged before God, has a struggle? Who in their life doesn't face these things? But when we die and when we see God, which category do we fall into? Which do we belong to? Which is the majority of our life? Which is what we truly are? That is the question this parable puts before us. We may be poor, crippled, lame, and blind. We may have things preventing us. We may feel unworthy. Whatever it is, Jesus says, I love you. Come in. There are those who have wandered, who have turned their backs on God, it would seem, who, for things that have happened to them, have let go of the teaching they received. Jesus has come back. Come back home. Hear this word of the gospel and come back home. But to those who were simply busy, to those who just didn't have the time for Jesus, to those who are without excuse on Judgment Day, they will be without excuse. And that is what Jesus is driving home for us in this teaching. It's not that he didn't have a place prepared for them. He did. That's what the Bible says. They were invited. It's not that he didn't want them there. He did. God wanted them there, but they would not want to be there. They found that they were too busy for God. So then let me go to our application. And with this, I will close. Friends, as Christians, it's very easy to be busy. I know it, you know it, we all know it. We can be too busy for the things of God, not making time for storing up treasure in heaven, not looking to God as our forever, not seeing ourselves as Jesus sees us with an eternity in front of us. We see this life as all that there is when we don't live by faith. When we don't live by faith, everything seems unfair. What's the point of virtue? What's the point of righteousness? The poor man is a joke. There's no hope for you in this life if you don't have the material circumstances. But Jesus says there is another life. There is a just life. There is a time coming when God will even the accounts. And he's telling us, friend, put your debit, put your expense on God. Don't put it in this world because then you will receive your reward in this world. Put it in heaven so you will receive your reward in heaven. Jesus has an obsession with wanting his people to not miss out on the good things God has in store for you. But we won't live for that if we don't live by faith. Faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. For Jesus, our friend and our Savior. Would you receive the benediction? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you... You blessed of the Lord, be blessed in your going out, be blessed in your coming in, 
from now till forevermore, world without end. Amen. Friends, the Word invites us. Jesus invites us. He wants us to be saved. He has a place prepared. He has His angels, the Holy Spirit, His messengers, His ministers, all these people coming in, speaking to every human heart. When we go out into this world to share the gospel, know the Holy Spirit and the angels of God go before us to talk to people's hearts, to invite them in. God doesn't deal with these physical circumstances. This is why he can get around them. This is why he can invite anyone. He speaks directly to our hearts. Everyone has a heart, and everyone's heart is known by God. So friend, when the invite comes, give your heart to God. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you won't miss out at all. Just one final thing. Let me review. There is a time for grace. There is a time for justice, for judgment, for recompense, for reward. But underneath it all, there is an accounting. Generosity, grace, and mercy is an unfair thing. It is an unfair thing. We will do it in this life, but our reward is in the next. We won't necessarily receive everything we deserve in this life for good and for evil. God's justice is have faith in God and he will vindicate us. Take care, friends. I hope you have a good week. God bless.